are natural way to represent concurrency, right? It's a, it's a way of writing a picture that says this, these things are running in parallel and there's a natural coordination mechanism that comes out of it also. But uh, languages haven't used that as a way to program concurrency. We have used sequence diagram as a way to describe concurrency. We often we explain a concurrent behavior by writing a sequence diagram. But normally when you write the code, you don't think of it as a sequence diagram. You write messages or threads and so forth and somewhere in there is, is a control group. In the case of Larina, everything is built on top of sequence diagram. So the entire concurrency model is the sequence diagram itself, and the diagram is the code. Uh, the way, way it's done is for every function, there's a separate sequence diagram. So every function is a, a set of concurrent workers that you can have, and you write a sequence diagram for it. And the syntax is a serialization of that sequence diagram. If, you, if you're familiar with something called websequencediagrams.com, it's a website that you can use to draw sequence diagrams. Uh, the language designed for that was actually inspired from that as well. So that, that has a very simple way of saying this is the picture, this is the text, and they go one and one. So, so the, the way the, the fundamental model is when you write a function, there is a, a block of code, and that's the sort of the main, uh, the default worker of that function. That's the main, the first line basically in sequence. And you can have any number of additional lines. Now in text, 
you can't write the, the code next to each other horizontally, right? The text has to go vertically. So we put the other blocks of code above the main one. Right? So there's the default worker and then there are other worker declarations that come before that. And when the function gets called, there is an initialization block first after all the workers run concurrently. And the way we manage this is through a concept called strands. So strand is an execution stack. So when, when I have one worker, when one worker when I call another function, that function can have another set of workers. The main worker of that function, called function, runs on the same stack. So you get a normal stack for one worker, but if that function has another worker, it can basically a new stack coming up. Right? So the strand is that sort of connection of the collection of sort of workers strung together to form that one concurrent life. And you can have a number of such concurrent lives happening at a given time. Right? And, and so concurrency is a cross source and communication is a cross source. Uh, I'll get into this. Uh, it'll be easier to explain the code rather than the right? And workers can communicate with each other by sending and receiving messages. And this, this area is called session typing. Session typing is a way of describing the, the signature of a concurrent block in terms of its external interface of messages in and out. And then two people who have compatible types can communicate without deadlock. Right? So in Barrena, if you can, if the, pro, if the compiler says this code is good, it cannot have a deadlock at the messaging level. Because there's session typing, or what we have done is a very initial level of session typing right now. Over time, we want to enhance this to write more complicated. Uh, communication patterns and be able to automatically validate that they are compatible. Right. There's a programming language area called session types. This is a fairly new area. It's very, very messy, but it's uh, it's very powerful. And that's the fundamental uh, aspect of what we've done here. OK. Uh, and of course, there's some concurrency control privileges. You have to be able to say, I want to have an exclusive access to this bit of code, uh, and so forth. Right. Uh, again, uh, first step we've done is very basic. There's a lot more that we want to do over time. There's something called software transactional memory, there's ownership types, there's uniqueness types. There's a lot of new concepts that have been developed in different languages. Rust has a concept of ownership. So in Rust, when I have a pointer, there's only one process that owns it at a given time. And only that one can, can modify it through that pointer. Nobody else can modify it. Uh, yeah. Swift has a concept of uniqueness, where there's only one reference to a given memory at a given time. And you have to pass on the reference to somebody else, and so forth. So let me just show some. Okay, so th this is a simple main function with two workers, two additional workers. And what this code is doing is saying uh, this block of code is a um, is called the initialization block. This happens before any of the other workers start. So that's the you know, initialize the environment for the concurrent workers. And then this worker W1 and W2, and this part, which is the default worker, all run concurrently. And if I look at the picture, you get a better view of this. You see what's happening is this is the default worker. So it prints the, the worker execution started here, directory runs before the other worker started, and then all the workers start. And th this code is being executed by the default worker, and here are the two other workers. And in this case, all the, the default worker is doing is waiting for those two to complete. And when they complete, the worker has a return value. <coughs> and in this case, they return nothing, and so it doesn't say it returns anything. And those return values are available through those variables. Here, I'm not interested in the return value, I'm not interested in the complete. Right. So, when you run this thing, uh, you get. Uh, so, the work execution startup comes uh, at the, while the workers are made. Initialize now there's something happening here, and uh, the two concurrent workers run independently, and, and then they, the main waited for the, the default worker waited for the new computer. Right. 
So this is a functional parallelism. Second one, second example is showing messaging back and forth, and there's two kinds of messaging that we can do, which is uh, one which is a synchronous messaging, the other one is an asynchronous messaging. Right? Synchronous means when I send, I wait for the send to complete before I continue execution. Asynchronous means post the send to keep executing. Right? The syntax is uh, this means synchronous send. This means uh, asynchronous send. Receive is always synchronous, right? Receive means give me the answer. I'm waiting for the result to come. Again, if you look at the picture, you can make this a little clearer. This picture is currently not drawing the synchronous uh, sense. Unfortunately, uh, the, the tool is still in development. Uh, so this is showing you the, the, the default worker starts and then it leads to worker start. This guy is sending INK to worker W2. This one is receiving uh, into the variable w1, reader w1, whatever it's getting from uh, w1, and it's printing out uh, what it got. Uh, then this is waiting for a response from the other side, so uh, that's what this line is showing. This is sending, it's receiving. And here there's a synchronous send that's not being drawn uh, graphically right now, so this is sending a synchronous send. That means it will block here until this one also comes here. Right? Send won't complete. Trying to receive the execution order within that So you are yep. syntax in line 30? Yeah. Syntax so in line 30, 30. yes. Yep. It returns an error, what does it mean? Um, this is uh, returning a, a uh, error or nothing. So this is returning oh, error. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because if yeah. there's an error, yeah. so a, a, to make the concurrency safe, yes. uh, there is a concept of panics propagating yes. across workers. Yes. So a, a, when, when a panic occurs, what kills, what gets killed in the panic is that worker. Yeah. Right. So the worker and their entire strand basically. So if somebody else is waiting for something from that worker, then it'll deadlock if you don't do something about it. So if a worker has panic, you get a panic propagating. So, and, and synchronous one is not a panic. Synchronous one would be an error. Because synchronous means I'm waiting for it. The other one is panic because I don't know where to handle it. Comes at an arbitrary time, I don't know what has happened. So I can't handle it, so panic becomes panic on this side. Okay, This is a fork join example. We have another construct called fork, which lets you, within a single worker, create sort of two local workers. So I'm running some code, I want to just do a little bit of concurrent stuff and continue on. Fork lets you spin off two workers or a number of workers, run them, and then wait for the result or wait for whatever I want from them. So in this case, now you see this worker uh, returning uh, a toggle of intent strength. So it's computing something and then returning a tuple of intent string. This worker returns a flow. So workers are almost like functions, except they're the single threaded functional body. Well, they be preferable from the implementation perspective having declared the workers above versus having only the default worker and then for job. Uh, so it depends on the scenario. So, so if the entire function wants to have a concurrent set of workers, yes. then you use full workers. Yes. This is, I have a sequential set of statements. Yeah. In the middle of that I want a little bit of concurrency. Yeah, but this would be the operational the behavioral difference if I have only the default worker and then I fork several other workers. Um, would it be slower or something like that? No, it's not supposed to be slower when they have yeah, yeah, sure. uh, so let me just uh, show a bit so, so. Yes. so Started later, yes. they are not started at the same time. Right. 
they start when the fork statement comes, right? And they keep going until the fork statement finishes. And then in this syntax here, what I'm doing is I'm saying, wait for those two workers to complete. And because there's a response, I'm now, this is an example of an inline type being defined. Because types are the structure, they the shapes. I don't need to give types names, the name has no meaning. Here I'm saying I'm getting a record of two fields, one called W1, one called W2. The first one is a tuple of type index string, but that's one in string, that's the one that the first one does. The second one is a field of type flow, so the second one does. Right. And this thing, this wave will block until both the workers complete. If there's a panic, this will happen. And when I come back, I know I got the results of the two workers. So it's an easy way to say I want to spin off to concurrent tasks, wait for them to complete, get the results, and move on. Now, execution sequence wise, the way this all works is workers are essentially a lightweight thread. Right? So, so they're, they're on a thread and an OSL. The strands become threads and an OSL. And even the strands, uh, when we get to IO, uh, I'll explain a little bit more, everything is non blocking. So strands get scheduled onto a thread. As long as the strand can keep running, it stays on a thread. When it cannot run, it gives up the thread. So if there's waiting for some I.O., it doesn't block the thread. So we can run, the entire validator runtime system can run on as many threads as there are cores. If you have two core runtime, you can just run on two threads and it'll work as optimally as you'll get with 100 threads. So again, it only becomes slower when you put more threads. There are some supporting stuff underneath to make the non-blocking work as around the thread pool and so forth because the underlying I.O. libraries we use are blocking. So the front goes to the thread port. So there's some underlying supporting threads that are there. But from a programmer perspective, I program as if everything is nice and clean and blocking. Underneath, I'm not blocking any system resources in order to execute the thread port. Okay. The fourth example is a, a, a question about yep. shared, shared, uh, shared state or shared variables. Do you have an example? Um, I don't think there's an example here. There's a lock construct for that. Okay. Do you have an example of this? No, right? Yeah. There's a lock construct okay. uh, that lets you lock, uh, and then you get a two phase lock on that, basically. So and if there's multiple variables within the lock segment, it locks everything and tries to get a global lock of all of it, and if not, it stops the execution. There's one other um, uh, thing that we have, it's called start. So you can, you can, instead of creating a worker, I can say I have this function, I want you to run this function, I don't care, I'm not going to wait for the result, and give me a handle to the function. You get a future back. The future is typed by the return type of the function. So in this case, this function, the sum function down here, returns an int. So when I start that function, what I get is a future of type int. Future parameterized by int, right? And then I uh, and and I can keep going. I can do other stuff. At some point, I can say wait for that to finish. Uh, in this case, I'll say wait for it to finish. I don't care about the return value. If I wanted the result, I would have come up with the result. Now this one, I can show the picture. This actually shows an interesting. So here, this code is calling, so if I show this guy, so that is starting there. Now this function, let me just show the code first. This guy is square plus q, internally has two workers. So it's computing the square and computing the q, right? concurrently using two workers. And Sending it, yeah, so some calculation internally using it to second worker. Now, when I look at the picture, if I expand that function, in the same sequence diagram, you get to see the full concurrency model of the program. Now, you can see that, okay, this program is running inside the default worker, I call some function called square plus q. Inside there, there are two workers. that picture you have to, the bottom is a little small, you have to first expand the uh, 
pulled from this button, that has to go to expand code on top, and then you go to the line that you want to expand, and you say expand there. And we'll have more useful ways of this is still going on. switch gears. Networking comes right from that. Uh, so networking also better has done something quite different from most languages. So if you look at everything from C upwards, network connections in the language are treated like an I.O. channel. Right? You get a socket and it's just a byte stream. And then after that, you do whatever you want, you have libraries, you do anything, but the language doesn't understand that there's a difference in this network. Ballerina kind of takes a different model. We view a network connection as a connection and a bidirectional one typically, where outbound ones can be synchronous, inbound ones are asynchronous, and there's a protocol that goes back and forth. So the application models have derived. Uh, the, the concepts behind this are all of these four things: endpoints, connectors, receivers, and services. I'll explain each one of those. Endpoint is an abstract thing. Endpoint represents something out there on the internet. Can be a database server, can be a website, can be a mail server, can be whatever. Right? Or it can also be my representation of it. If I have a client stuff, if I have a client for some remote thing, that's also an endpoint. Right? So endpoint is a, from a network connection point of view, it's the two ends of a network connection have two endpoints. Right? That's what egress versus ingress means. Egress means outbound, ingress means incoming. Right? So if I open a socket and I say I'm listening for connections, I'm an ingress. Egress endpoint means I, there's some service out there I'm making a connection to that service. <clears throat> and uh, the way we map this to SQL diagram is we model endpoints as actors. Now this is slightly off because they're not concurrent. But we model like that in order to explain from a modeling perspective that there's an interaction happening between the two. And it becomes very clean when you do that. You can explain as you go along and see um, connectors are the things that I write to establish some protocol connection to a remote service. Right? These are called client objects. And a client object is just a regular object, but certain methods can be tagged with the keyword remote. So remember that RPC question we had earlier? We said RPC and I answered saying RPC doesn't work because it hides the fact that it's a network call. So in Baradena, you don't hide the fact that this function that looks like a normal function is a network function. So that is what the remote keyword means. So an object that has a remote method is a client object, at least one remote method. And that remote method is then known by the caller as, okay, this is a network interaction. So even syntactically, the way they program it is different. And therefore, the error patterns and so forth are different. Uh, show examples of this. Examples of this. Another important thing is, a, a, uh, so I'm sure some of you know about WSTL or Swagger or something like that, right? Some network description, interface description, having some IDL of some kind. And what you do with an IDL in, in a language really is you generate a stub. When you generate the stub, the network aspects are hidden inside the stub. And what you have is a normal language construct, right? It might be a JavaScript server of functions, it might be a Java object, it might be a Whatever, right? So uh, it's all hidden inside the other network details, which is nice because somebody consuming the function doesn't need to worry about the URL and all that kind of stuff, the security credentials and everything. Uh, but the person consuming it doesn't know this is a network behavior that can have different kind of faults and so forth. So with Darina, you can write a, a remote object which takes an existing remote object and creates another layer on top and continue to make the user of that uh, object aware that I'm actually talking to a network. So for example, I can take the HTTP client object and write a connector for Salesforce. And the Salesforce connector will have a method saying get accounts, get customers, get opportunities, etc. Those are remote methods. Those will get tagged as remote methods in the Salesforce connector. Because inside there, I'm using the HTTP connector. And 
the sales force connector or that has decided that it's important for the person using this function to know that this is a network connection. So it lets you propagate the network nature up to the application to the level that you want. Listeners are the other side. Listeners are when I want to offer a service to the net. Right? I have to listen for connections. So a listener is a, is a special object type that basically opens some kind of a network protocol. It might be a HTTP port, might be a TCP port, might be SMTP, might be maybe making a JMS connection and pulling from JMS, whatever mechanism is doing. And then once something comes in, it dispatches to someone to process that. Was it, what does it dispatch to? It dispatches to services. A service then is a type of value in Valena which is a, a collection of resource functions. Now we have remote functions for client stuff, for outgoing ones. Resource functions are functions that are invoked asynchronously from outside the system. Network message comes in, connection gets accepted, and then data comes in through that, then the resource gets in. Okay, those are called resource functions. We use the word resource because of restful kind of concepts, uh, but it's really not about rest because it's just network services, right? But resources seems to work, so we can do that. And because network communication is not the same as function invocation, uh, resource function when it's invoked, the result of that function is not the return value of that function. The function wants to explicitly send a response back if it wants to send a response back. And if it doesn't want to, it's its business. You'll see in the examples why we do it, right? Okay, let's get some examples. Chantal, you want to take away? I don't know how to explain the issue. Until it starts with the issue? Yeah, yes. Okay, so it's the simplest example. I'm calling get, so it's shown as this. So remember what I said, the client endpoint, we show the endpoints as actors. Right? So even though the endpoint is not logic, I'm writing the actual endpoint, I mirror the actual service I'm talking to as a vertical line here. Okay, that's the most natural way of drawing a picture, explaining what I'm doing here. I'm sending a message to that thing, I'm sending a get request, and I'm getting a response back. Now, get happens to be a, 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 a synchronous call, right? I make a get. Back. So it, it, when, I, when I do that, when I write the code, I just say get and I get a response. Underneath what happens is this worker, because get is going to be blocking, right? I send it if I make an establish a connection, I send it the data, HTTP server takes some time, I read the headers, read the payload, then I can come back. While that blocking is happening, this worker is paused and waiting for the network stuff to happen. When the network stuff is ready, the work gets rescheduled for execution. So thread blocking doesn't happen when I write the code like this. Even though I'm writing a blocking call, code, I'm making a blocking call in the programmer's mindset, underlying there's no resource blocking happening. And then there's some kind of response thing that just printed some stuff out based on that. The response is printed the response. Um, here it's sending a post. So same, same thing. Yeah. Um, 
so if I want to do asynchronous uh, HTTP requests, I would combine this with the worker? Or is yes. Some so, it, it, so this is asynchronous with regards to the runtime, right? So if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted to write it asynchronously in your parallel output, you could either start that call, so it's a function call, right? I can say start, the get yeah. on that, and I get a future back. Okay. Then I can wait for the future, or I can spin off a worker, and in the worker I can do more than one line of code. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right? But uh, most of the time you want to do asynchronous in order to not block the current working thread. Mm -hmm. So that is automatic in that. So in Node, if you're a Node programmer, right? In Node, you know, you have to do all kinds of callbacks for everything. Mm -hmm. right? The callback is done in order to not block that thread that is running the event of it. That you don't need to do because the runtime takes care of that for you. Language runtime. You you do the asynchronous only if you want to explicitly make the call and while that call is happening, you program something else mm -hmm. and then wait for the development. Okay. So this is a very basic HTTP service. It's a very simple one. It creates a new list on port 9090 and assigns, attaches a service to that listener. Now, in this case, I didn't give the listener, I didn't assign the listener to a variable name and all that because I'm only attaching one listener to that, one service to that. I want to attach multiple services to it, I have to assign that to a variable and then say on and give that variable name. Right? Uh, and here, there's one resource function. Now, notice this is really, service is just like an object can have functions, but can also have resource functions. Resource functions are the ones that get called from outside. Again, it's very important that service is a different entry point. This is where the concurrency comes in again. Main is the normal entry point of a program. Right? You write a program with a main. That's what the programming language starts off with. Some single entry point. If you have services, you have additional entry points. So every one of those entry points is a resource function. And they get called in some context and so forth. This caller is another object that we pass to indicate that that particular connection. Remember in HTTP and TCP and so forth, even though you're listening on port 9090, when you accept a connection, you get a new socket and you have a direct connection to that caller. Right? So when there's a request, if you want to reply back, you can reply on that socket, not the listening socket. So that is represented by the caller. Now, now you see the response concept that I mentioned. Now this function doesn't say it returns anything. Now, if this function could throw an error, you would have to say returns error. Right? This is saying this function never throws an error. I try to, I, I respond directly. I call the respond uh, operation on the call object. Again, if I want to see what else is there on the caller. Right? Um, so it's HTTP, so I can say continue. Send 100 continue response back. WebSocket upgrade and so forth, this whole WebSocket stuff. It, it, uh, promises that if you do redirect, is to send a redirect response back. Uh, respond is to send a normal response back. Right? Redirect takes a code, redirect code is a 300, a 301, a 302, 303, all normal HTTP stuff. Right? So you get full control of the HTTP protocol with this network abstraction. And if you see the picture again, you will see.
So this one is a slightly more complicated one. I was doing the HS uh, as binding, sorry? Mapping to the path. Oh, yeah, the mapping to the path. Sorry, yes. Let's show that. So, uh, yeah. so this also allows us to show something that we have in language called annotations. Annotations, annotations. It's a way of providing some additional information to the runtime system or the compiler or whatever using a metadata model. So valid annotations can be used to uh, are used in various places. In the case of uh, services, we used to give some additional metadata that are transport specific. So in this service syntax has no connection to HTTP. The same syntax whether it's HTTP or MQTT or RabbitMQ or whatever. Right? But there are some HTTP specific things that you need in order to be able to run this. For example, what's the path on the that you need to attach this resource? By default, we attach it to the name of the resource. So it becomes slash. The service goes on slash. Uh, now in this case, service config says put this service on foo. So this echo service goes on slash foo. And then the echo method, the echo function, echo resource, sorry, will go on slash bar. So we move this here called slash foo slash bar. And then this resource gets called. So uh, this is a service that has another service like this, like a proxy scenario. And I have a service, when I get called, I turn around and call this other service, right? So this is showing, this is the resource. I get a call, and I get the call, I forward to this thing, and I get the response back, and I do some checking, and depending on what that logic comes out, I send the response back. So 
that's what this board is doing. So I get a request coming in, and I forward that request directly to the backend service. And then depending on what the backend sends, if it sends a proper response, I, I respond with that response. I basically forward that response to the caller. Java and making it work resiliently is going to take a quite a few more to code that. So that, that's what Baron has achieved. It's extending the abstraction layer of programming network scenarios to a much higher level so you can think and operate at the same level of network stuff that when you draw the picture. When you draw the picture, you say, I want to call this service, and the response, if it's good, send it back. If it's not good, do something else. Uh, the code is the picture in this case. Oh yeah, sorry, back in this case, the backend service is also running on the same machine. Right here. This is the case of I'm declaring a listener here. No, it's different ports. Oh, different ports, sorry. You're right. Yeah. So this service is running on this listener, 9090. This service is running on 9092. And I'm uh, just forwarding, so I'm kind of talking the same, same machine, different port. Same process, different port. So HTTP2 is a bidirectional protocol. You can have a stream. HTTP2 lets you create streams on top of the HTTP connection and have bidirectional communication. So the defining the listener is same as defining HTTP. Instead, they have to say a configuration saying that from the start this has a HTTP2 protocol. So that is done through this one. And uh, this is uh, basically another service.
Okay, promise to respond to that. So it runs. So the service is now up and running. So you see that uh, I have added log statements to just to show what things what really happens is that so it got two uh, promises and the second one it rejected it and it also got another one and it was the actual uh, response for the original request and then it, it uh, basically uh, consumed the promised resources. So the two was rejected and you said that I'm only interested in one and two. So that's why you see. Service is started. What I will do is create uh, a just use my browser console. So I will write some JavaScript code to connect to the WebSocket service that we have started. So if you check the readme of that uh, WebSocket directory, it has all the, uh, the JavaScript code that you have to write. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new WebSocket connection. So so when I do this, I should see uh, some blocks. So it says new client connector. So this is getting more than the one open method. functions, one for one message and one for one close from the JavaScript console itself. So these two are now registered. So what happens is when someone uh, invokes this service and since uh, I have registered this JavaScript function, the server also will call this function when there's a one, one message or one close. So let's send a so you can see that there's a log me. Uh, so this one is actually coming from the code. If you check the socket service. So you can this is the text that was pushed from uh, service to the client. So likewise you can do uh, you can also write web socket services. Let's talk about some uh, invoke a connector. So we have uh, so we can explain a bit. So there's two levels of network abstractions that we, we think about. One is the protocol driver levels, like uh, TCP sockets, HTTP, SMTP, uh, XMTP, that kind of stuff. Those drivers we we have written already basically. 
ready for be ready for this behavior protocol that we support. If, if you, whatever we write, write us for that. Then on top of that, you have lots of SaaS APIs. Right? Twitter has an API. Right? Those guys need an HTTP client, and then you have a Twitter protocol that you need to implement on top of that. So that's what this example is using using a Twitter connector that has been written. We can show the source code also. Then, then it uh, uses the Twitter connector. You want something to show the example, and then we can go ahead. Yeah. So what this does is just a, a service which, uh, when you invoke this resource, basically uh, does a tweet. Oh, you can write the command that like this. Arena pull slash. If you run this, that should uh, pull the package and it will be available in the run. No, the run method you should be able to. So, uh, Twitter client has some configurations, so if you are trying to access a Twitter client, you need some authentication and authorization. So this one, uh, we already have a, a demo Twitter account. Then run the so it will basically use that config file and at runtime that config module will get those values from uh, that config file. So these values will be applied and Values, actual value will be accessed at runtime. So you can see that I can just call this with uh, some text payload. So whatever I will give as a payload will be used to uh, use as a Twitter uh, message. Twitter message. So I'll just run. So my message is some hello. And uh, so this is the code that this service is running uh, using curl to invoke uh, this service, and it's a post method. So let's see how this one. So let's 
says successfully treated. So, uh, so uh, the source that we use in our example is wrong. This is the actual definition of it. So you can see that uh, it's basically an object, but you say it's a the additional keyword for client. And uh, you can see all those uh, the methods that we try to access. So you can see that there's this remote keyword that we are using. So if you don't have this, it just becomes a function of that object. But with this keyword, this becomes a remote uh, yeah. And uh, these are the implementation of those methods. syntax for documentation. Right? And you have to put the documentation if it's a public single. Compiler won't let you push the module for global sharing into the, the Rhino Central repository unless you document it. And if the documentation doesn't refer to all the parameters, they won't let you push it out. So, it's, so the goal is to write code that is meant to be used by somebody else. And so if you're documenting it, you're documenting it correctly. Now, we don't do any semantic validation. You can put some garbage text there, but at least you must refer to the parameters. And there's a, there's a grammar for that. So there's a markdown-like syntax that goes right next to the entity that you're documenting. And there's a separate tool that generates documentation from that and generates nice HTML documents. If you go to the Barina website and you see API docs, they were all generated from the source. Like this. Well, it'd be like Java doc, but instead of Java doc being a later addition and, and not being coupled to the language, this is not part of the language.
PS4 ID, when you mouse over to one of the types, let's say this is a current object, so the documents that you see here is actually is generated, uh, you get it from the documents that you have put in when you are writing. So this is like the Maven repository. It's, it's, it's version packages that get pushed here. And they're owned by somebody who has documentation on validation of that So this is generated from the source code. Then there's other stuff like that, but it, there's all kind of, all the protocols are supported. So whatever is going to see there. Try to is basically a broker, yeah. so there are one is a producer consumer. So the consumer is basically a service, whereas the producer is a main method. You just publish some message to a queue. The consumer will basically listen on that. They will listen to the rapid connection and this code. So very briefly about the I.O. package, there's a, obviously when you, when you pull the I.O. library to do all kinds of stuff, 
So one of the things we've done with Darren is to be very careful about looking at I.O., the whole problem of I.O., not just bike-level I.O. So if you look at I.O. from a holistic point of view, there's, at the lowest level, there's always bytes. Everything is a byte stream somehow. And then on top of that, with Unicode, you get some kind of character concept. So characters are Unicode encoded sequence of bytes that come out as characters. And then you could have records. Records are fixed length ones, something that's a binary or some kind of formatted structure reading that you do. Um, and, and then on top of that, there are various APIs basically. So if you want, if you want to read bytes directly, you can manipulate read and write bytes directly. Data I know is this idea of taking a sequence of bytes and saying, I know binary serialized representation of it, and I want to read four bytes as an integer, the next four, four bytes as a float, that kind of uh, aspect. Uh, characters is, is taking the bytes and applying the Unicode encoding to it. So you know how to uh, read and write the, the characters level. And so characters can be read directly. The XML uh, IO layer sits on top of character, the XML sits on top of Unicode. JSON is a proper Unicode. Console I.O. is directly on the character's uh, API. Right? And records are, again, similar records can be in binary records or character records. Uh, so CSV file is an example of a record-oriented uh, stream that you read, record by record. Uh, or if you have a fixed length record system, you can read something from the whole mainframe or something. That's a byte, uh, byte records problem. <coughs> and we have a general delimited record I.O. concept. CSV is an instance of and all of this sits on top of uh, whatever kind of I.O. sources and things, so files, software, devices, whatever it is, doesn't really matter that. Uh, uh, I think I mentioned this already, the way you program with I.O. at the application level is always in a blocking model. Underneath, nothing is blocking. Right? So if you call something, the threads don't block, the programmer worker, the program worker will block, but the underlying uh, I.O. system will run asynchronously and release it. Work of it and is uh, ready and the desire will be processed. And so I mentioned how we go from bytes characters to record. I'll just show a couple of different pages here. Different logic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that you? So there's just a couple of examples. This is a program that just simply reads bytes and writes it around the file. It's a, it's a file copy program. I just, just to demonstrate the uh, I.O. Uh, so you open a uh, read, uh, you open a file and you get a byte channel, you read bytes from there and write to it. So reading and writing is a normal kind of reading and writing. Uh, you go into a loop and you read as much as you can. And then Here and a socket listener. Uh, socket's actually part of the network layer, but just to demonstrate here. Uh, the socket listener is like a HTTP listener, except that you are, there's a protocol, you just get whatever the bytes that come on the socket. And so there is again, like for with web sockets, there is a, a set of predefined methods you must have in those resources. So on read ready means the socket is ready to be read, there's some data you can read it. On write ready means it's ready to be written. And on error means something. Wrong and so this is the non block the asynchronous input for, for a listener. On a client is your opposite side, I establish a new socket connection with somebody, and I can uh, send, I can write, uh, sorry, uh, write messages to it, and I can read from it. Uh, so in, read, in this case, I'm reading by attaching a callback service. So whenever there's data available on the socket, asynchronously, I can call. So I.O. is straightforward from a user point of view, it's not really that different from I.O. in the other language. The difference is the implementation uh, gives you a blocking experience. OK. 
okay, so security. Um, it's a very different topic. So one of the things we want to make sure is when you write a network oriented program, uh, the programmer is uh, forced to think about security. Uh, because writing network services and not thinking about security is just suicide. So we want, we want to force the programmer to think about the security aspects of it. Uh, and, and so at the same time, we want to make it easy to establish security. Otherwise, you're forcing me to do something and it's annoying as hell and I can't get around it. So, so what does really security mean in this context? The, the, we, don't, we don't address all aspects of security like this. There are three aspects we are dealing with. First is you can't trust things that come over the network. You need to verify. For example, you don't take a piece of data that comes over the network and chuck it into a database without checking. Right? That's a SQL injection attack scenario. Uh, so there is, there is a concept of data that's coming over the network not to be trusted. And the other is authentication and authorization. If you're publishing a service, you should know who's calling you. So it's the authentication part. Authorization is just the person who's calling you at the right to execute this code. Right. Uh, so to, uh, to trust in, there is this concept called tainting. Tainting, the idea of taint is when something, I uh, get something from the network, that data is considered dirty, not clean. That's what taint means. It's tainted somehow. You have some, something that's not nice for you. And, a, and if I touch that data, that is, if I get a, a JSON payload from, from the network, and I take a field from that and assign it to a new variable, now this variable is also tainted because it's coming from some tainted data. So we propagate taint analysis through data flow analysis to find out which parts of the program is tainted. And, and, and so if, if something is tainted, other parts of the program can say, I don't want tainted data, I want clean data. For example, in the, in the database connector, the query string says it must be sensitive. It must be stacked as a sensitive piece of data, meaning it cannot have tainted data. So if I have tainted data, if you try to call it, the compiler will say, no, you can't call that. This data is tainted. You need to clean it first. So again, forcing the program to be aware that you got something from the network, you're trying to send it to something that says, I, I want to make sure you, you know what you're doing, you give me good stuff. Right? That's what the tainted analysis uh, manages to do. Uh, to untain something, you have to actually do something. That is, I get some data from the network, how do I know that this is good enough to be inserted to a database? I have to do some checking, I have to look for some characters, remove characters, there's a shell script, I have to shell, I'm from an executable shell script, and check whether it has escape characters and so forth, right? Uh, that stuff has to be handled by the program. And, and uh, once uh, in, in the current implementation, we have an untamed operator, which they can use indicate that it has been updated, and that is going to change uh, in the upcoming version to have a database annotation. So, uh, but basically this is done by annotations. I'll, I'll show you an example so you understand. Uh, the other part is authentication and authorization. So authentication is not really part of the language per se, but in the connector architecture and all the transport chemicals we are doing, we are putting authentication capabilities into the into that platform. So, so when, if you have an HTTP endpoint and you, you want to say this is a secure HTTP endpoint, you have to just put an annotation saying it should be secure, and then unless there's an authenticated person coming in, it won't allow that call to go through. And authorization is similar. We have a concept of scopes, which is an idea borrowed from all. Uh, so each resource can say this is the scope you must have in order to continue. And if you don't demonstrate that scope, the call will not be allowed. Again, it's not really strictly in the language, it is part of the standard library, but because we consider this a Veracruz platform, it's part of the Veracruz platform architecture, we say that these things must be considered in the right code. Okay, let me show the code. So in this case, I'm reading some data from the database, and, uh, and here you see an error. Uh, uh, the compiler is complaining here because this. Uh, oh, sorry, it's log zero. Yeah, I'm taking the, the. This is a main. I'm taking the command line argument that I was given and passing it directly to the query. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm passing a tainted value passed to sensitive parameters given query. But I say, no, you can't do that. You have to first untaint that value and then do it. Here's an example of it. Right here. 
So here, here there's some other function that Jean has defined here. This one here, some random function here. It says I, I take a string parameter which is sensitive. That means don't call me with tainted data. So the default is you can call it tainted, not tainted, whatever data it doesn't matter. If you want to care that you don't want to be called tainted data, you put that annotation saying I don't want to be given tainted data. Then the compiler makes sure that so if you try to call that function uh, with uh, so let's just do this one first. I'm taking out zero that's not clean because it just came off the command and I don't know what the person typed in. If I want to clean it and call it, I can say uh, untake that and then call it. So we're changing this. Instead of having untake like this, we're going to force you to call a function that you define that takes tainted values and returns untainted values. But this is too easy to get around. And we'll have a library of pre built tame functions that do things like by SQL injection checking, we have some stuff defined. By GP query parameter checking, we have something defined, things like that. So, a common problem with HTTP is when you do an echo back with something that you got from the request, uh, you can send back stuff that makes a client misbehave. You can redirect the client somewhere else to get something. Right? So, that, that's a lot of money to change it. And then here, this is showing an example of uh, here I'm making a database uh, query, it gets an error, and uh, uh, again I'm calling that sensitive function, but the JSON data, because it came from the database, is considered tainted. And now I'm accessing the first name field of that data because it's a, a field of a tainted value that's also tainted. Right? So there's some data flow as that happens. And if we also keep that as the tame signature of a function. So, so because if a function is written and goes into some module and some other module calls it, we have to be able to check from outside that function without knowing the source code function, whether this can produce a tainted values or if I give a tainted value, does it give me a tainted value, if I give a tainted value, or an tainted value, things like that. So that's called the tame signature. We record that when we compile it. And we use that during linking to make sure that across models that the tainted and maintained correctly. Okay, so authentication is straightforward because so in this case, this is a this is a client case. I'm giving a, a lot of credentials to access this API. Um, another client is another example. Uh, uh, the code is protected. Uh, Sorry? It's called yeah, it's called Ruby API. Uh, so we don't have a, a scopes example here, but it's similar model to the service. Kind of tables, 
do a spreadsheet like table and up CSV files and a bunch of stuff. So there's more work in the program that we have to do here to finish this job. Uh, graph data is also interesting. So maps and records are getting to address in your graph values very nicely. Uh, GraphQL is a graph query language. So it's quite nice. You basically do a template for the results that you want to see. And the query engine runs through the data structure and gives you the results back. Used primarily for APIs. But we kind of see how you could possibly use it in the language itself. So if you have a data structure, you can kind of walk through and find something to write loops to write it. If you have GraphQL embedded, you can just say, here's a data structure, here's a query, what is the answer? And because we know the structure, the compiler can code generate that stuff for you without having to program it. Uh, streaming data is a streaming SQL extension that we've done. That we have a thing we did sometime ago called Safety, which is a complex memory processing engine. This is a uh, sort of bringing of the uh, Safety functionality to this extends SQL with streaming concepts. So instead of having a table, a table is basically a finite size table. A stream is like an uh, infinite long table of which you see a small part at a given time. So at a given time, you only see a table, but the table is moving on and on and on continuously. The row that was at the bottom case will now to the top and eventually falls off the top. It's kind of a conceptual model of streaming queries. And we have a syntax here as well. Okay, so we can this is in the extensions directory because streaming is in the uh, sorry, experimental directory. Oh, sorry, let's start with the tables. So uh, here there's a person record here and, and there's an order record and so forth, and here you get a cable with the person as the row type of the table and the, these are the columns and I put some rows into them and it's populating the table with this table. So streams, this, this is a kind of a good example of a stream. A stream is basically a thing where a, a, you publish an event to it and it ships the event out to everybody who subscribed to the stream. And that's, it doesn't have any state. Whoever's subscribed at that instant gets an event. So, and it's typed. So here it's just saying this is a stream of employee uh, types, employee records. Uh, uh, and here we subscribe the function to it and then publish. Uh, 
employees and then publish it to their history. And publishing that every time you publish it, this function will be called. So these tables and streams are current, they are in memory. The streams are in memory, yes. And the tables also. Table, the, the tables that we showed you are in memory. That's what I meant for mirror table. The thing that we want to work on is the ability to mirror a database okay. table conceptually as a table, not actually being in memory. Mm -hmm. okay. So in memory tables would be useful if you are loading like a CSV file. Mm -hmm. And you want to get a table out of it very table is not going to very very So there is this table called forever, slightly confusing on standard. Basically, uh, so streams, stream is like a river. It just keeps on flowing. There's no beginning, there's no end. Right? You can tap it any time and you can see what's going on at that instant. But if you miss it, you miss it, it keeps going. Right? Uh, so when you, when you write a filter, when you, if you want to process a stream, you have to attach a piece of code to that stream and just keep running. And you're writing patterns. So this this query, this is a stream query. What this is saying is from the person stream stream, which is a stream of persons. Whenever I see anybody whose age is less than 16, right, select that person's name and age and address and uh, push it off to another stream. No, it's not. So think of it as a uh, event stream. That's say, say I'm, I'm looking at uh, whenever somebody walks in through the door, there's a detector and it's sending an event. So you have something like the detector which gives you then. Yeah. So events keep coming every once in a while asynchronously, mm -hmm. and I want to do pattern matching or I'm doing temporal queries. So I want to see. Uh, give me an alert if if I see more than three people. So I can write that query quite easily in this language. I can say where the, the I can get a window of length three if the length in, if it happens within one minute, I can get push an event on. That's the kind of stuff you can write in this. So this is event stream processing. That's what this uh, so is event driven in the um, you're defining your event by yourself. You're defining the event type by yourself, somebody else pushes into that stream. Now in this case, this is a boring case because we are pushing some events into the stream ourselves. It's a test case. Okay. But normally you tap into some information source, such as uh, you might be. So, Twitter, for example, has a streaming API. So, you can attach to a Twitter and then you can get events from Twitter, right? So, when that comes, you can push it into a stream and then have a program that is running continuously that is pattern matching and doing query over time. The, the main point is, uh, as we go along, the data that, that a program needs to process is no longer just static data. It's moving data. So streams are moving data. So we want to bring moving data concepts into the language so we can actually process moving data along with static data. And integrate that for network services. Because most of the time, moving data comes over the network. It needs to be delivered back out over the network. So I want to look for patterns and something goes I want to call some service. Is that another? Is a common set? Anything else? That's it. That's it. Transactions. So. Talk about data, you have something about transactions, otherwise, I mean, well, um, So, again, the goal that we have for transaction stuff is 
make, make it easy to write correct transactional programs for programmers who don't really understand transactions. Because which is most of the time, most programmers don't understand it. And what we see in practical cases, if you look at Java code, in Java if you want to handle your most transactions, it's perfectly fine for a transaction for it to fail, you need to retry. But you need to program that repeatedly and therefore it becomes people have to catch that exception and they write the logic to retry and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, we want to make those cases quite easy. And we want to support both local transactions as well as standard transactions and support different transaction models, uh, compensation into PC and so forth. Without requiring an external program involved to manage a transaction. So how do we do all that? So local transactions are uh, part of the language. There is a transaction syntax. And if you say transaction and you write some code inside there, uh, if yeah, when you say transaction, we, we start a coordinator and we'll explain that in a second. There's an underlying coordinator that's created. All the parties that are joining the transaction join that. And then if something fails, it'll automatically retry. By default, we retry three times. You can turn that off. You can say, I don't want to retry at all. So, because if you're writing a transaction, you should understand failure in a commit is normal behavior in a transaction. So if it's normal behavior, we don't want to force you to write some code to handle the normal behavior. So we'll have that for you. If you want to, if you want to take over, no problem. You can say retry is zero. Don't retry. I mean, you know, I'll take care of it. And and if it committed, we tell you that committed. If it aborted after retry or whatever, we tell you what. Um, so for distributed transactions, uh, uh, we have a new microtransaction protocol that Frank has created, uh, and and it's basically it's an interesting protocol because what what it does is. It creates a, a sort of a personal coordinator for this transaction. And then when we need to get another distributed party involved in the transaction, we, we bleed this transaction context over the network to the other side. And the other side joins this transaction coordinator. And, and then this coordinator takes care of running the transaction protocol. And if everybody is success, uh, complete successfully, network messages go out and then the transaction comes. And if something goes wrong along the way, the transaction reports and nobody commits. Right? So, uh, why is this useful? Microservices. So, if you're running two microservices, so one of the themes of microservices is local data, local management, and so forth. Uh, and one theory of microservices says don't do any distributed transactions. But in practice, that becomes very difficult for many scenarios. We're supposed to do eventual consistency and all that. Uh, but sometimes it's difficult. If you want to do it, Barina, if, you, if both parties are running Barina, uh, I make a network call over to the other side. I send the transaction uh, uh, coordinate information in the call. The other side knows that all these headers there that means I join that uh, coordinated to join that transaction. And if something, uh, and then it will participate in the protocol and take control of the actual execution on the other side and become part of the whole coordinated execution. And if it's not Barina on the other side, it is a protocol, so you can have a stop or something that implements it. So we have a sidecar written down, for example, in Spring Boot. One component in Spring Boot, one component in Barrera. Uh, we can call it a transaction and, and commit that transaction directly on both sides. Um, uh, there's another, there's a similar version, one, one for UPC, one for compensation. So the compensation one means there's a corresponding function uh, for, uh, if there's a compensation, then the compensation. This is still also a work in progress. It's, it's working, it's there, uh, but there are some improvements we need to do. The nice thing with this is that uh, you don't need to have a separate transaction coordinator. Now, that means you don't get persistence of transactions and so forth. If you want that, you can still have an external coordinator and point to the external coordinator, no problem. Right? You work with an external coordinator that maintains state and so forth. But in a, micro, in a web service scenario, I'm trying to order something, some, I, I want this to work. If the connection fails, because my connection to the client is not transactional, if I lose the connection, I, I'm lost anyway. So there's really no point in my remembering and continuing because I can't go back to the original call. So, so, uh, so there are use cases when this sort of uh, slightly stateless transaction is actually very useful, which is what we are addressing here. If you want a full normal transaction, no problem. You can bring up a third party transaction manager, we point to that, and do this coordinate. Right. I'm 
I'm not counting things, but I'm sure I said all kinds of things, but I'm not sure I'm supposed to know you, but uh, I'll try to show you the recording. Okay, so here we have a database connection to some database, uh, and I have a, a an update I'm doing on that. And then, okay, so here this is what it is. Those are not within the transaction. This is just regular. Yeah. Uh, so I just try to figure out some works. Here I'm doing an update across. Uh, I'm doing two updates. I want to make sure I do both or nothing. So in this case, the, I try to. I one, then I play the other. Now, because I'm within the transaction statement, the, the, the database connector is aware that, okay, now I'm within a transaction. So, the database connector joins the coordinator. Now, when this happens, the coordinator has come up underneath. And I don't deal with it, but there's a coordinator that came up. The database connector joins that coordinator. And then, uh, if a bot gets called, it'll the bot go back to all the other participants and bot the transaction. Retry gets called and retry, so, and, and, and these these are sort of completion signals. On retry, you get to, if you want to put something out saying, hey, I'm retrying, uh, and permitted means that you can permit it, so. And when, when, you come, when you come at the end, unfortunately, you don't know whether, whether it was committed or reported, you don't know, you have to do some other test to find out. I don't think we have an example of a distributed case, right? There is a document for the microtransaction stuff. We have to publish it. We have a little bit more to finish the document. So configuration, Jishan showed sure a little bit about the configuration stuff. We are going to be evolving that as well, because that one requires you to remember the name, remember the type, and do it two, three times. We are trying to bring the idea of configuration into the language itself. So when I declare a module level variable, I, I, you will be able to say configurable something something. And then that means the value of that variable can come from outside at program startup time. If, if those of you are old enough, old enough to have used the XML system, Remember the extra resource management uh, stuff where you could specify all kinds of things and then at startup time all of that gets set up for you based on what you set up. It's similar kind of model. Uh, so configuration will need to be will be improved a little bit, but the idea that applications need to externalize configuration is very fundamental in enterprise applications, especially across life cycle states. When I'm in the dev environment, I need to point to one database, I have a different set of credentials. When I'm in the test environment, another database has a credential. Front and back and other database not right? uh, If you're familiar with Docker and Kubernetes, Docker uh, does this because the whole idea of Docker is you create one image, and the same image goes through the entire life cycle of the development process. And the way that works is by externalizing the configuration. So, same program runs, but if you're running in the dev environment, it picks up one set of values, so, uh, staging one set of values, production one set of values. So the, for configuration, so we have this uh, config API and the language support. Language support is, uh, is the one that's under, under development right now. Uh, config API is what uh, Shantan showed you uh, already, which is the one that uh, does it. Config colon get this property. It's like a name value that look up, so it's a straightforward thing for that. This, this is a big pain point in most applications because you have to, everybody has to invent the configuration manager. Uh, so you know, when I was a grad student, if I wrote a program, I wrote it, I was make, I built it, and ran on that machine. Right? That, that's now gone. Nobody writes a program and just runs it now. You write a program, you make a Docker image out of it, you write some YAML files, you deploy it to some management platform, then it runs it, maybe it wants to, under some other control, right? So there's a lot of layers involved with taking the program and actually getting it in execution now. And all of those layers are what we call DevOps. Those DevOps stuff is completely outside the control of the programmers. The program really has no idea how this is going to run. So if you want to bring that 
more to the program directly. So let the programmer search saying, I want my program package into a Docker image like this, and I want my Docker image package into a, a Kubernetes deployment and, and running like this. Right? Uh, if you are familiar with Kubernetes, Kubernetes requires, uh, Kubernetes is a container management platform, uh, requires you to write YAML files, uh, usually hundreds of lines of YAML to say how you want your program package and deploy it onto a Kubernetes cluster. So Valina has a model, uh, so, so if you look at the language compilation, basically compiling a program, if you take a C program and you say CC 4.C, you get it out, right? Uh, that process, uh, in, in the case of Docker, so or, or creating a YAML uh, or creating Kubernetes artifacts, what you need is the compiler to be extended so it understands there's more to comp compilation than just creating the binary. Create the binary, then wrap it up into a Docker image, then wrap that up into a Kubernetes deployment, put these YAML files, all of that stuff. So a, the Valina compiler has an extensibility architecture. So when you write an annotation in Valina, you can say this is a compiled time annotation that extends the compiler. When you register some additional stuff in the compiler, then the compiler lets the annotation fit into the compilation phases at the different times, so it can even validate the construct of, it, of, of the annotation. So in the case of Kubernetes, for example, there is a type, that there's a Kubernetes annotation you put next to a service. At compile time, it will validate that the annotation is semantically correct. Because your code, the extension code runs, looks through the thing and validates it. And then, that's, uh, and then, then in, in, in the case of Kubernetes, it will actually generate additional artifacts. In addition to generating the binary, it will build the Docker image, it will uh, execute the, uh, the Kubernetes YAML creation and all. What happens is it creates the image and it also uh, put that uh, into the Docker registry in your local machine. So when you do the, if you have Docker installed in your machine, if you say Docker images. So I have a few images, but you can see that uh, there's a new image that was created. Like so, this is the one that was created. Then Dalna builds that service. So it creates a Docker image for that service and also. Uh, install that into the local image. So you can start now. This is a Docker image. You can start the Docker container using the command. So
can invoke this and yes, whether it's working to do the read me and get the third one. Since I started this using uh, this port mapping, I'm mapping my 1990 port to the proper exposed port. It will basically first build this service, create the Docker image, and create the Kubernetes service using uh, the required set of files. So those files are available in this. It will be generated in, under this Kubernetes directory. So you can see that the deployment file is the create deployment YAML file for the Kubernetes uh, deployment. So these are the normal. Uh, these are normally written by the devil, but that will be generated for the program. Using the annotation and we get the values from those annotations and we generate the YAML files. So running that is uh, so when you invoke this 
command using the two CTL uh, command line tool. So if you basically uh, start the service, it, it will uh, initiate the, uh, it basically it will deploy the, the created content, the Docker image in a, as a Kubernetes service. So these are standard uh, CTL commands where you apply a deploy a Kubernetes service. So in this service, I think we have given uh, as a mapping. So you can do a, you can basically map postname map your request to this postname and then uh, it is mapping to the 
before we actually see what happens. So just to summarize, uh, the goal for Veruna as a language is to make writing these applications like three to five times faster in terms of the ability to write the code in a way that actually works reliably and consistently and so forth. A lot of that comes from the abstractions of sequence diagrams, comes from the network uh, concepts, comes from the transaction stuff, comes from the data. All of those things that fit together, uh, removing data binding as a problem, Once you put all that together, if you take the complexity of writing the application or web service, the goal is to get it down a significant factor from what it takes in Java or Go or Python or Google. That's what we are targeting this. Um, once we have native compilation, performance will be basically native level performance. Right now, it's uh, once this version that we're using is not the JVM based version. Once the JVM based version comes, it performs basically at the same level as Java uh, because it has Java by codes. But uh, once the native stuff comes, it won't have the memory constraint of Java. We are also trying to get uh, there's something called GraalVM, which is a native compilation for Java. We're trying to get that to work uh, for this as well so we can compile it down to native to Graal. That's better than Java, but not as good as genuine native, so we will see if we can do better than. Overall, the language status is it's ready to go, it's usable. We are, we, it's already being used in commercial products. Dabrisco has an API gateway, which is using an older version of Valerina, and it's in commercial use. It's performing your problems, and it'll be much faster once we have this release. Uh, and and the core of the language that, that is, we are publishing as stable is, is solid. Uh, there may be some small problems we don't need to fix, but we don't really expect to have any major engineering work. So we will start committing to that language. Confidently tell people that it's okay, go ahead and learn it and start using it. Uh, once it's July, it should pass out. And then, uh, uh, once, uh, a, a, and then we'll keep working on finishing the other tasks. It takes some more time, so the plan is it will take probably at least the end of 2020 before we finish all the parts that we think needs to be there to make the package fully address the problem.
compiler, the tooling, the packet, the document, the central side, documentation generation, testing framework. We didn't talk about testing, there's a whole different testing framework. We didn't talk about packaging and modularity and all that. There's, so there were 50 engineers working on that part of it, and then there's maybe another 20 people or so working on the layers on top of it right now. Okay. And they've been doing that for about three years almost. Mm -hmm. So it's a big effort. Learn to scale a developer team 
those aspects. Yeah, this is for the
zero for the user, then it's okay, no problem. Okay. So Sanjeev, I gave you a couple of hours to take a swim. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the afternoon. Yes.